Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Hills. So Fresh Bread Kills are the videos in which I talk about the books that I have recently finished reading. And I'm going to be talking about two fiction books that I read in the beginning of January of 2024. Um, that would be this collection from Arthur Macon, uh, The Great God Pan and Other Horror Stories. This one is from Oxford University Press, really cool looking edition. And also Lord of the Flies. Um, so I'll talk about this one first. Uh, <clears throat> I've been, for the past actually couple of years now, going through the major gothic slash horror works of um, the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, I am now finally pretty much in the 20th century. Now there were some certainly works that I missed along the way, uh, but I mostly did in chronological order and tried to hit the ones that were most interesting to me. Um, and uh, this is my second to last really for that. Um, in February, I'll be reading The King in Yellow. Uh, and that'll kind of end my, my 19th century journey, for the most part, not end it. I mean, it's, I'm just not going to focus on 19th century <laughs> after that. I'm going to read a lot more 20th century this year. Um, so this was, a, this was a part of that, and this was a, um, The Great God Pan was something I know known of for a very long time. I know it was very influential on um, H.P. Lovecraft, and, uh, you know, I, this edition especially is one that I was eager to read. So... This is a collection that has multiple horror works from Arthur Macon. Most of these are from the 1890s, although there are some from the early 20th century, even to the 1930s. Uh, most of them are horror. There are some selections in here that I don't think really would classify as horror. Like, um, there's his very short story, The Bowman, which was kind of a inspirational um, to especially the British during World War I, uh, which is an interesting, weird tale, but I don't think it's really horror. Um, Although there, there are certainly some works in here that do classify it as horror and um, do so very, very well. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into detail on about a lot of these. Um, usually my fresh red kills videos, I don't consider these to be formal reviews. This is just me giving my thoughts. Um, it's been a few weeks since I read it, so my memory is not super fresh. But just want to give you my overall impressions. So. We have a pretty good introduction in this, as is usual for um, Oxford University Press. And we have The Lost Club, which is a very short story, one of his early stories, I believe, um, which I like quite a bit. Um, and then we get into The Great God Pan. Uh, now, The Great God Pan, it's essentially a story, um, well, it's, it's almost like multiple stories put into one. We're seeing things happen from various points of view. And uh, there is the overall story about this woman, Helen Vaughn and uh, some terrible ends to some elite gentlemen in um, London society. And uh, it begins with a, an experiment in which a man is claiming that he will be able to basically tap into the other side, into another realm, um, at least mentally. He uses a, an unfortunate girl named Mary, um, who is basically an orphan and doesn't have much uh, much going for her at all, um, that he has raised, almost like for this purpose. And he is going to do an experiment and have her, in order to enable her to see the great god Pan, which is basically to see through the veil, through to the other side. Um, and it is successful, but it ruins her mind. Um, and from that stems these strange occurrences that we end up seeing other people get involved in. Um, now, coincidence does play a very large role in this story, <laughs> um, in a lot of these stories. Um, and sometimes it works better than others. The, I, I, I kind of wish that uh, Macon had had some other ways to maybe bring characters together or bring them in rather than just rely almost always on coincidence. Nevertheless, I can get by that. Um, we follow uh, uh, multiple gentlemen through time. Um, they keep running into each other and finding things out, and they become aware of this woman named Helen Vaughn. And uh, like I said, there are some basically well-to-do Londoners who uh, have everything going for them, and then eventually they um, sort of succumb to, it seems like, sexual debauchery, which is not specified, and then eventually they end up killing themselves. And this woman, Helen Vaughn, seems to somehow be connected to all of these men. And we end up having kind of a... a an ending worthy, I guess, of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, an ending that kind of happens off screen, in a way, or off the page, which I, I can't help but say I was a little bit disappointed by. Um, we basically hear of something happening to a character 
secondhand, um, which I don't need to have all the details. Um, and I can see for some people that would make it more horrifying, possibly. But just the way that the story is structured, it's not all epistolary. Uh, sometimes we're just watching people have conversations, so I don't see why we couldn't have actually seen this thing happen rather than just hear about it secondhand. Nevertheless, um, this does bring up a lot of really interesting, I guess, uh, you know, questions that we could have about this time period um, and what this sort of thing would mean. Now, I'm aware that that sexual debauchery, um, that could be code possibly for homosexuality. Uh, the fact that these men do kill themselves, um, you know, uh, Victorian gentlemen <laughs> were not supposed to kill themselves. They were not thinking in terms of like mental health and uh, people with chronic depression. I mean, to, you know, for a suicide would have been really unmanly. Um, so it's, it's an even more embarrassing end for these guys in the end. So we have these, it looks like Macon is kind of looking at um, themes of manhood in a lot of ways. And then I would also see classism play a pretty, pretty big role here. I mentioned that girl Mary, that unfortunate girl who's made to see the great god Pan in the very beginning. Um, you know, she comes from basically nothing. She's basically an orphan. Uh, and, you know, because of that, she is seen as fair game to a well-to-do scientist um, to kind of do, do to her as he wishes, uh, with no, no thought of legal repercussions, nothing, you know, caring about this girl's future at all. Uh, she is of a lower class, and therefore she's basically expendable. And so it seems like when you have these high-class gentlemen dying later on, it does seem a little bit like a classist revenge. Um, you know, there's that, I, I'm only, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly, but um, I remember somebody once said, uh, English literature is always about class, American literature is always about race. And I think there's some truth to that, but I can't help when I especially read, um, you know, English, English literature uh, to think about, how much class is playing a role in this because it becomes very prominent in this type of literature. Um, now, throughout that story and through others, uh, making just some really interesting things. I find the, especially from a horror realm, um, I find the idea of kind of looking through the veil of reality to see through the other side, I find that a very appealing um, way to go about bringing in horror. Uh, and he does it especially by looking at the layers of the past that were very clearly visible in the English or Welsh, it was also Welsh, uh, countryside. So you can see, you know, ancient Celtic remains, you could see uh, especially the Roman remains. So you see this pagan past. And Macon, who is not somebody who I think I would have gotten along with. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things about his biography that he's kind of disagreeable. Um, he seems to be a real religious conservative. Uh, he was uh, pro-fascism in some uh, respects. He's just not somebody that uh, that sits anywhere on the, the spectrum that I do. Um, but nevertheless, I do like his, I, his playing with that. Um, now, I think that in the Victorian era, they did, they did kind of make that separation between um, like satanic and pagan. Uh, Pan would have been more of a symbol of like debauchery or hedonism um, back in uh, the Victorian era. Now, even though, even though there's not usually an explicit correlation between satanism and this paganism, uh, I think that Macon does kind of treat them much in the same way. Uh, to come across something pagan is something is to come across to come yeah, kids talk <laughs> to come across something horrifying, um, something to be wary of, something to be destroyed. Um, so you know it's very very contrary to my own uh, opinion on such matters. Um, I love finding things like that, um, but nevertheless he's playing with that fear that you know that something that we thought, including the Roman Empire, that had been gone for for millennia. Um, might not really be gone, right? That pan, even in the modern world, um, that, you know, we've kind of gone about our lives and uh, thought that we've moved beyond. No, it's, it never actually went away. It's been there the entire time. Um, you know, it can still basically rule over this domain, um, at least for those who can see it. And all that stuff, I think, is just great, you know, a great idea for a story. Um, I really, really like that. And it comes about in other ways in this. Um, he draws a lot on this kind of this pagan past, um, especially in the countryside. And then he his other his other stories often take place in London. And London is very much a different environment. It's like every street in London is like its own 
microcosm, its own ecosystem. Um, to go two blocks over, you might as well be in a foreign country. Um, and often, it's a place that is filled with malice and, uh, and frightening um, aspects. So uh, he's got those two basic settings and those two themes that he continues to work on. And he does so very, very well. We're introduced in some of these stories to a protagonist that he uses over and over again, a guy named Mr. Dyson, who also has his friend named Mr. Philip. Uh, but Dyson, he's this uh, wannabe, wannabe writer. Um, I don't think he's necessarily very good at writing, but he wants to be a writer. But he keeps kind of getting himself caught up in occult detective work. Um, sometimes it is very armchair detective work, where he's just basically looking at scraps of paper, and sometimes he's much more proactive and uh, going out and investigating. So uh, you can kind of see little, I think, hints of like a Sherlock Holmes and Watson in, a, in Dyson. He's very different from Sherlock uh, as a character, but I feel like the essence is basically still there. We have the novella, uh, The Three Imposters in here, which really is more like an anthology of various stories that are tied together um, by the idea of these three imposters, these three antagonists who are in search of uh, a young man with spectacles, and they're going to do terrible things when they get to him. And each time Dyson, actually, and his, or his friend Phillips, uh, comes across one of these imposters, they're told a story. Um, and these stories can feel very separated from the rest of the uh, rest of the story. Um, in fact, two of them, I think it's the novel of the Black Seal and the novel of the White Powder are often anthologized separately without context of the three imposters, um, you know, basically framing device of this novella. And I can kind of see why. They are definitely the two strongest stories uh, that are in there, and you don't really need the context of three imposters, although there's nothing wrong with reading three imposters. There's some good stuff in there. Uh, but those two, those two short stories are basically uh, the highlights, and they are really, really good. We also see Dyson in the story um, afterwards comes the Red Hand and uh, see the Shining Pyramid. And those were both good. I really like, like those. Those were fun. Um, we see, I'm just going to look through. Uh, there's, there's some like kind of uh, flash fiction in here as well. Uh, very short stories, only like two pages. Um, they, were, they were okay. Uh, there's the, uh, the story also of the White People, which was very good. Um, I like that one quite a bit. Definitely one of the strongest stories in here. Uh, very odd. It's like this girl kind of being, um, we're, we're reading about this girl. I think, if I remember, I think it was from her point of view, something she wrote down. That's right, yeah. And, uh, she's sort of being seduced, um, by something in the woods. And there, if you kind of read between the lines, you can see, uh, the more sinister aspects and the witchcraft that's involved. And that was really, really good. Um, and the rest of them are okay. Uh, there was one called N that I, I think this is the one that I'm thinking of, um, that I like quite a bit, uh, where, where he's looking at London and the layers of London's history, uh, you know, living in a city, whether it be London or New York, where they're constantly rebuilding certain sections there, New York, especially, you never stop building it. But, um, you know, where was once a building 20 years ago, there's now something completely different there. He's playing around with time and with memory. And once again, was seeing into the beyond, um, you know, in certain locations, which I think is done pretty effectively in that story. So, you know, I'm not going to get into every single story, but um, overall, I did certainly appreciate this book. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I can see why this is so influential on later authors. And um, yeah, uh, you know, I can see myself going back to Macon at, at certain points, um, but I'm really glad I read this. And, um, you know, I did, I should mention, I read this kind of as a group read as well um, with uh, uh, Greg from another Bibliophile Reads. He was also reading this. Um, there is a, a subscriber, Sonia, uh, who also was a part of the read. And um, I think they all like The Great God of Pan also quite a bit. Um, but yeah, that was, it was a fun read. And then I followed up with reading The Lord of the Flies by William Goldner. I should say rereading. Um, I had decided that in 2024, um, and I have a video about this, but I'm going to be reading 10 banned books. Um, and I'll try and link the video below if I remember, uh, 10 banned books in 2024. And this was one of the books that I had on my shelf. I basically looked at my shelves and see which ones are on banned lists. And this is one of them. And I had read this in high school, but I didn't have very strong memories of it. And um, 
I knew I needed to give it a reread and to try it again. And I did actually, um, it was part of a buddy read with uh, Randy um, over at the Literate Texan. I'll leave a link to his channel below, though he was feeling kind of ill at the time, and I don't know if he got around to finishing it, but, um, you know, I, I look forward to hearing his thoughts if he did. I know that he's read this a few times and he doesn't like the book, and he was wondering if he was going to like it more. Now, I sort of remember liking it in high school, but any book that I read in high school, I mean, I... I, I kind of have to put in air quotes that I read it. Um, you know, I wasn't paying that close of attention to it. And there were certain things that I did remember quite well. And there was a lot of things also that I realized I was misremembering. And I was combining different elements of the uh, story um, to create whole new elements. So part of my fascination in rereading this was actually exploring my own memory <laughs> and how it has changed over time. Um, now, of course, this is a pretty well-known book that was published in 1954. Um, we have a group of English schoolboys who, uh, whose plane goes down somewhere in the South Pacific, and they are basically alone on an island trying to survive, and um, Golding is basically showing how civilization will fall apart, and we will go become warlike and violent, and, uh, you know, basically if you don't have law and order, um, people will basically just start murdering and practically eating each other. And, you know, I take some exception with some of that. Uh, I can get into that in a little bit. Um, so I remember that. I remember it being a dark story. Um, as I was reading it, I knew it was published in 1954, but as I was reading it, I was kind of just assuming that it took place in World War II, because that was part of my memory. And then I kept getting confused by what I took to be anachronisms. Uh, they talk at one point, the kids mentioned TVs a few times, and I'm like, kids in World War II aren't going to mention TVs that much. Um, I mean, the invention existed, but it wasn't like a, a common thing for people to really talk about. You know, a kid in the 1950s, yes. Uh, there was that, there was, at one point they talk about how the Queen has a whole room full of maps, and I'm thinking, wait, the King was still around in World War II, why are they talking about the Queen? You know, so I'm thinking, is he being anachronistic? Uh, so it was confusing me for a while, but then I realized I should have read the back. Um, which I didn't read because, again, I had read this in high school. But the back says in the description, it says, at the dawn of the next world war. So I'm like, oh, this is like a fictional war. So I, I'm doing all this basically mental gymnastics trying to figure out what's going on uh, with his his timing. Um, and I really didn't have to be doing that. So I was about a quarter, maybe almost halfway through the book before I realized that finally. Um, now, I remembered certain aspects. I'm going to try and keep this very spoiler-free in general. Um, I remember there being the body of an adult. And I also remember somebody basically getting stabbed to death in the night in a frenzy uh, with these kids. And I'd actually combined those two things that it was, I thought it was the pilot who was flying the plane who uh, ended up getting stabbed by the kids because they thought it was a monster. Now, I can understand after reading this why I created that new memory um, from here. So uh, I was right there. There was somebody who could stab. There was a body. Um, but it was not the pilot. And, uh, you know, I was wrong about a few things with it. Uh, but overall, I liked it. Um, we have our main character. Um, was it Ralph? Right? Um, I think that's our main character, if I remember correctly. Uh, who's a pretty good character. I liked Piggy um, quite a bit. Even when I was in high school, I remember feeling really bad for Piggy. Of course, these are like 12-year-old boys or younger, so as an adult, you can get a little bit frustrated. Um, not necessarily in, um, I guess you kind of want at certain points them to say something kind of smart, <laughs> especially Ralph, who's a leader, um, but he's not. He's he, he has a moral compass, and he has the ability to basically uh, get people to follow him, at least for a while. Um, but he is not a speech maker. He is not always very good at making his points. And as an adult reading this, you can get very frustrated, I think, with that character. But again, it's pretty appropriate because you're looking at a bunch of 12-year-olds. And I like this quite a bit. Um, I don't think that this is how people would act when they are in a group. Um, actually, last weekend, my wife and I went to a comedy show. And uh, there was one bathroom in the whole building. And there were a lot of people in that building. And uh, we will comment on just how orderly and how helpful everybody was inside the bathrooms. Um, you know, just making sure everybody had their turn and can get to the garbage cans. At one point when I was in the men's room, the lights went out for like a minute and everybody was totally cool. You know, it's, uh, it's just when people are in a group, especially if they're in a vulnerable uh, situation, I think a lot of them will actually try to help each other. Um, and uh, I think there was actually a case from, like, from boys who in the 1960s, like, ended up on an island um, in a similar situation to Lord of the Flies. And uh, 
when they finally found the kids after months, like they had like built shelters. They were like, <laughs> they were actually really happy and like playing. Um, they had cooperated really, really well. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that this is how people would act in this situation. However, you know, Golding was a veteran of World War II. Um, and as a sort of analogy for um, the wider human race, I think this is actually pretty effective. So, uh, yeah, um, that's kind of how I, I view it here. And I liked it overall. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was pretty, pretty decent. Am I going to keep going back and reading it over and over again? No, I'm not. But I am glad that I reread it. And again, it was one of my banned books that I wanted to get to in 2024. Um, so those are two books that I read at the beginning of January, two fiction books. I've got The Great God Pan and Other Horror Stories and The Lord of the Flies. Um, if you've read any of these, and I'm sure you read this in high school too if you were an American growing up uh, in my era, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. As always, thank you, Bluetooth.